uh, no, sorry to say this, just if you guys have two pieces of paper, that's the thrust which the uh, electric propulsion system produces, unlike chemical. But what's the advantage is, there's uh, nothing to stop you in space. So cons you don't switch off your engine. I'll compare electric propulsion and chemical to incandescent bulb and LED bulb. So it has more life, so you don't switch off. So constant acceleration over a period of time, you have an incremental delta V. So you keep uh, increasing your acceleration and uh, that's the advantage with electric. Small thrust, but over a period of time, you, go, you travel much faster. But chemical, everything you burn up in one minute, but you continue to move at that same velocity. So the thrust is much le less, but the only thing is you keep using it for long. Thank you for the fabulous presentation. Appreciate it. Uh, does Bellatrix have a five-year or ten-year plan? If yes, what is that plan? Okay. So certain things I can tell you. Uh, so um, our immediate goal is to have the thrusters qualified, and we have been talking to a few customers in India and abroad to deliver the propulsion systems to them. And uh, the long-term plan is, of course, to create something called as your uh, uh, in-orbit servicing. So yeah, there are dead satellites, you service them, if you want some junk to be brought down. See in future, uh, you see people like Musk and all, they want to do something called as uh, launching thousands of satellites, right? So your orbital space becomes your real estate. So uh, once a satellite you know, uh, reaches its end of lifespan, you have to clear that orbital slot so that something else comes. And uh, small satellites, they, they might not have the propellant capability in it to do a deorbit maneuver. So you can develop uh, tugs which can go and stick to them and then you can bring them back. So uh, that's a very difficult thing to master. Bigger companies like Orbital and all have been trying to do with very little luck. But hopefully with ML and AI in the way, I think we can uh, have a go at it. So that is the long term plan. So mainly we want to cater to the uh, propulsion requirements of anything and everything that goes into space. Uh, so, your electric propulsion, is it suitable for what range of satellites and uh, do So, we have thrusters for, uh, right from 50 kilogram satellite up all the way up to 5 ton class satellites. Okay. So, are you anytime planning to build electric thrusters, I mean electric propulsion system for CubeSats? For CubeSats, we offer uh, electric propulsion systems. It is there, so we'll debut it uh, next year. It's going to space. It is there. The only problem with CubeSats, they can't give continuous power. Yeah. So uh, with battery, I think you can do intermittent uh, uh, modes of firing, which we already have a solution. Continuous will be a problem. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, correct. So I can't discuss much on it because it's a collaborative project between us, ISRO and the French Space Agency. So, uh, I'll let you know more in, uh, say, two, three months' time. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, actually, how well, uh, you are talking about the electric propellant uh, for different satellites, so yeah. how well it is fail-proof? Because, uh, like, space is a hazardous environment, and does your electric propulsion system is, like, uh, is affected by the environment, or uh, is there anything? Uh, only electronics are affected by the radiative environment and thermal sense. So these are very rugged metal engines, so they will not have any problem per se. But uh, there is always a problem of your engineering quality control. You have to ensure that the fuel doesn't leak. Uh, so I have this joke, the propellant storage tanks cost you more than the th uh, cost of the thruster. So that's the problem, but uh, uh, electronics you have to rad hard on it, of course, uh, that's a different ball game. So uh, the higher you go, you can't use commercially off the shelf electronics. And you can't even do a radiation tolerant design, uh, you have to do a, uh, go for rad hard components. That's on the electronics side. Yes, Kadadar. Rohan, what are your thoughts on the EM drive and quantum drive and propellant less microwave thrusters? Uh, that's a good question because uh, since we started using microwaves to ionize a gas, we first, uh, this was a hype in 2011-12, uh, um, uh, this um, propellantless propulsion. So we tried out, uh, but sadly we didn't get any results in a vacuum system. So uh, I don't know because, see, it is violating laws of physics. If In space, if you expel mass only, you move. So if it's not expelling, they say it's Casimir effect. And, uh, but it's too small to 
measure it might work it is too small to measure on ground because of the disturbances which are already there and uh, it has to be tested in space uh, I'm hopeful though I'm not a skeptic about EM drive but uh, it can't be done on ground because of the outside effects which we are having so we have thrusters from 20 watts to 20 kilowatts so if your satellite can give a lot of power, I'll give you a bigger thruster. Uh, we are not coming this year. Uh, so we'll be there next year. Yeah, because uh, we are going through this qualification and we don't have much time to travel this year. Yes. Yeah. So since it's a new technology, I would like to know how do you uh, get the requirements for qualification testing? Who defines it? See, uh, our journey is um, in Bellatrix, um, we face a lot of hurdles because um, ISRO also has certain uh, uh, facilities like this which we require, but they do not give it to you because they have their own tests going on. So we had to invest a lot of money into this. And so it just because we have the passion, the perseverance, we are continuing. It's a sinkhole. And um, um, there is demand, but the only thing is, before you do something like this, you have to make sure you invest in all these things. So for all the qualification, everything, we have put up our own facilities in IAC to do that. How do you see your technology evolving over the next decade? Yes, um, so uh, we see because requirement of satellites have, uh, is going up day by day. There are a lot of people coming to launch a lot of satellites. And um, as I told you, you your uh, uh, problem of colliding with another satellite on orbit, the probability is going high. And there is a solid requirement for deorbiting of satellites, all these things. So we see this technology um, being incorporated. And since it's more fuel efficient, and it can be scaled down to tiny thrusters. So there's a requirement. But the only thing is you have to invest parallelly into a lot of R&D because uh, bigger organizations like uh, the Russians or people in the US, they have, they have also been investing a lot. So in some or the other way, we have to catch up with that. Hi. Uh, given uh, you are the first uh, startup to be working with ISRO, what are the top three challenges that you faced working with ISRO? <laughs> I don't know how much I can tell about that. But of course, they've been supportive. And uh, there's a misconception that ISRO doesn't uh, want anybody to come up and they want to have a monopoly. But uh, that's not the thing. If you have something uh, which ISRO needs, they're open to collaborate. So that has been our experience. So these uh, senior people in ISRO are all this knowledge houses. So they've been useful. So uh, our experience with ISRO has been good because to us, everybody inside ISRO is a mentor. And they, they openly tell that they see us as their children and they don't have anything. So we have got a lot to learn. See, qualification, how do you do something that, is, that works in space, right? You can't send, if something goes wrong, you can't some, uh, send some technician to repair it. So uh, stringent qualifications, how do you do a review? So ISRO's one, um, uh, uh, their uh, special power, I mean power lies in how they do technical reviews. So it's very grueling, but how do you do them? How do you conduct PDRs, CDRs, all these things you learn? And how do you engineer basically something that works? So because from a proof of concept to something that works, so this was our journey, but I have nothing um, negative to say because in our own experience, it has been good. So you mentioned that one of your co-founders uh, uh, contacted A.S. Kiran Kumar through an event like he had to hand it to. Like you said, one of your co-founder met uh, Kiran Kumar in an event and he handed out papers and it was a really tough job to do. Mm -hmm. So now for new entrepreneurs, is it the same way we have to find, it, find ISRO persons in an event and hand them out papers or they have a way I to approach? Your, uh, see, kismet. <laughs> so you have to believe in karma. Yeah. Compared to chemical and obviously electrical has more, uh, more what do I say, more precision, right? Yeah. 
so uh, uh, in case like for uh, space travel it has to go far beyond mars or thing so that in case of that thing i think wouldn't the electrical be way much better true because see uh, it's not uh, a chemical is very good when it comes to having quick turnaround times but there is no petrol station in between mars jupiter and all so you have to fill it up from here and shut it and get it there so what gives you more mileage it's naturally electric so if you see the dawn missions to asteroids they all use electric propulsion so if you are going inter- i mean inside the solar system interplanetary travel as i call uh, electric is the only choice So in future, if you want to take humans to interplanetary distances, we call something known as nuclear electric propulsion. Because the farther you leave from the Earth's sphere of influence, your solar irradiance factor keeps on decreasing. It's around one watt per meter square in a uh, thousand watt per meter square in Earth orbit, 500 watts at Mars. So it keeps on reducing. So solar panels become inefficient. But electric thrusters are the choice. So you need to have a small nuclear reactor which provides that power. So that is the future for larger cargo. The smaller ones can still do with. Like an hybrid. Hmm? It's like an hybrid. It's like an hybrid. Yes, yes. So you can't use nuclear propulsion as such because you know, that also gives something called as higher specific impulse. Okay, uh, the amount of fuel per, uh, burned for uh, per kg of thrust produced is more with nuclear, but with electric, it's ten times more. Okay. So uh, if you want really, really big cargo like 150, 200 tons, then you use direct nuclear. It's called NTP, nuclear thermal propulsion. But if you want somewhere around 20, 30 tons to, you know, uh, transport, NEP is a good choice. <coughs> yes, sir. First of all, congratulations to your journey so far. Uh, wishing you all the very best for the future. So uh, my question is kind of uh, both uh, right side aligned and left side aligned. I talk. I understand your uh, passion and your perseverance on the journey so far. On the right side, how do you see yourself as making money going forward? Mm. See, uh, this is a very unusual field to make money though. Um, making a subsystem in a satellite. See, it's a propulsion is a subsystem in a satellite, but it works on certain uh, strategy. But see, worldwide there are only around 11 companies which are doing propulsion, compared to hundreds of companies which are into uh, satellites or government contractors, big people. So uh, this technology, there is only uh, hardly 10 to 11 people out there. So there is a market for you to. Catcher and propulsion is a requirement, and uh, we are trying to address that gap. So that's why I say when I say going to space next year is very critical. That's why that's why I mean because the late you get, other players will come and you have to close down your doors. That shouldn't happen. So strategy is very critical here. So that's why the team should comprise of people uh, who will say what is the state of the, the space industry and how you should you do course correction. It's very critical. So if you are in this field, you have it's not just technology. Yeah, I, I I understand the criticality, but then as you're kind of productionalizing the whole thing, uh, competition is also going to catch up with, and it's you'll have to see a new front frontier. So it's going to be very critical for you to move on from there. Yeah, True. thank you. So we are an R&D company to answer. So we don't take care of, we don't do production. We tie up with uh, uh, vendors who do production. So we are not investing into that. So we are trying to reduce our risk in that area. that is confidential as of now so i can't okay, say see it costs around 70% less than a conventional chemical propulsion i'll stop it there okay, okay. i think we can talk in my line because we have we have a whole thank you so much hello
just kind of thing. It's a copy of this, so feel free. I think this time is looking a bit too uh, cooked up. So <laughs> there are no restrictions. Move around. Yeah. Okay. Ah. Okay, so we had uh, two interesting conversations. As you see, both of them were actually not uh, from an ISRO background as such. They were independent people who tried to do space. Now actually, Divyansha will be speaking and uh, he actually has a very deep uh, ISRO background because he studied in the Indian Institute of uh, Space Science and Technology uh, at the ISRO campus and then uh, later on quit ISRO uh, to start his uh, venture. And um, uh, basically, he uh, he's built uh, India's largest uh, amateur rocketry ecosystem, uh, where he's gone on to many states, uh, hundreds of schools, and now has trained uh, a lot of young uh, people in model rocketry. So I'll allow him to speak about what he did and how he did. Hello everyone. Um, so, thank you Narayan for that introduction and super interesting event. Uh, uh, so, just to give you a small introduction from my side, again uh, Indian Institute of Space Science and Technology. Uh, so, I was one of the first, uh, I was one of the students in one of the first three batches uh, in that college. So, when I joined, uh, there was no alumni. So, when I was applying for uh, the college, the first batch of that college was moving from second year to third year. Uh, and at that point of time, we didn't really have a lot of, uh, I, I couldn't really get a lot of people who could answer my questions about uh, what kind of experience would it be, what we would do. On paper, it was a dream. Uh, so we worked, uh, we were, our campus was located at the Vikram Sarabhai Space Center at that point of time. Uh, our electronics and propulsion labs were the labs that were inside Vikram Sarabhai Space Center at that time. We had pro, uh, professors like Dr. B. N. Suresh, Dr. K. N. Nainan, uh, even Kalam sir for a while, uh, who he came and taught us a few lectures. So, uh, and it was 100% free. Uh, so we got free boarding, free lodging, free education, and then we got a job in Israel. So on paper it was just uh, this absolutely amazing deal and as a child I always wanted to get into space. Uh, that was more of a dwindling dream uh, and I wasn't as sure about what I would do with space or what really is that I want to do uh, at that point of time. But uh, this seemed to make this dream very very real. Uh, so that's how I ended up at IST in Tirunanpuram, Kerala from Punjab. Um, Spent five years in that college. From a learning standpoint, gained amazing insight into the industry. Uh, had absolutely amazing mentors, learned a lot, saw a lot of interesting things at ISRO and within college. Uh, but that was one side of it. Uh, the other side of it was, as soon as I joined the college within the first uh, one year over there, I sort of realized that uh, I don't want to work for ISRO. Uh, so, Imagine working in a municipal corporation and then imagine that that municipal corporation builds rockets and satellites. So that is what ISRO is. So they build rockets and satellites, amazing work, very difficult and they do it brilliantly. Uh, but at the end of the day, they are a government research organization. They are highly bureaucratic. Uh, the processes are slow. Uh, there are scientists who feel that they're young scientists who feel that their job is basically that of a postman because they have to post one document from one department to another and then back and then to another and then back. Uh, there are young scientists who are deployed in security. Uh, so they have to keep the campus secure. <laughs> so things like that happen and you getting a design job or you getting a role where you are actually doing something very interesting and IP as said by others here as well that you need to get to 40 years of age and uh, at 40 years of age, Rohan actually quoted SG. You do not become an SG at 40 years of age. <laughs> you are at max an SE or an SF at a 40 years of age. SG is at least 48, 49. Um, and even in as, as an SG, it's 
fairly difficult to sort of start your own design project within ISRO for tech. So that was something that was uh, uh, clear to me within the first year that, okay, this is amazing work, but this is not the work culture or the work environment that a person like me would thrive in. And just to give you a small perspective on a person like me, I have been suspended from every educational institution I have been in. <laughs> so I don't do well in systems. Uh, I uh, tend to rebel, I like to do things my own way and uh, ISRO was definitely not something that was going to offer me that. Uh, so at that point of time I was really, really disillusioned that what I would be doing, I wasn't sure. Then, then during my second year in college, I discovered this very, very interesting thing called model rockets. So how many of you know what are model and amateur rockets? So, okay, very few people here. So, model and amateur rockets are these small rockets, uh, kind of like model airplanes uh, that you see. So, the ones that we build are, uh, the smallest one is just 13 inches tall and the tallest one is approximately two and a half feet tall. Um, and these things fly on solid chemical propulsion. So, uh, this is what Rohan was, uh, so yeah, this, this is one of the major reasons that I wanted to come in and talk after him because he was talking about his amateur rocketry journey where he told you guys about uh, how he uh, procured potassium nitrate and how he uh, mixed it with uh, denatured sorbitol and then burned everything up. So while he was burning all of that up, uh, exactly in that very year, this was 2011, uh, I was actually discovering model rockets. And I was actually finding out about these super interesting, uh, fun things. And uh, I had built model planes, I had built helicopters, I had built robots, uh, we had built a blimp. Uh, me and my roommate were crazy like that. We used to build all kinds of stuff in college. Um, and so model rockets obviously became this next thing that we wanted to do. And we had this amazing space college at our disposal. So we had the best labs, uh, all the mentors that we needed and all of these super interesting, uh, super knowledgeable people and amazing facilities and we could not build a model rocket. Uh, there was not even a single component available, there was not a single part available. The best thing that I could build was barely a rocket, forget a model rocket, it was kind of like a Diwali rocket. Uh, fuel was altogether another uh, crazy scenario. So we uh, did, so both me and my roommate, we were uh, not really very enthusiastic about burning stuff up, especially we were not enthusiastic about burning ourselves up. So uh, we had a lot of safety precautions in mind. Uh, so we did not, definitely did not want to move towards the sugar propellant. Uh, there are various problems when it comes to safety, safety procedures, degradation of propellant, so on. So we started studying and what could we do? So we started experimenting with different kinds of fuel during college. Um, and we started building our uh, own stuff. We, during this time, we did some very, very interesting experiments. Some, uh, and we blew a lot of things up. So for example, uh, our uh, chemistry lab in college had this uh, massive oven to sort of dry uh, whatever you need to dry. And uh, we had our very, very hygroscopic propellant. Um, which was supposed to be sun dried over one week. But we being students, we did not want to wait one week to fly our rocket. So we thought, why can't we dry this in this oven and we will keep the temperature low. We will say keep it at 80, 85 degrees Celsius only. So that should be fine. Uh, this was around 1.30 in the night. Uh, there were two of us in the lab and the lab keys were not on our name. It was on somebody else's name, which was beautiful. Uh, and we emptied this oven and we kept our uh, propellant into the oven and one hour later we hear boom <laughs> and the oven is gone uh, and we just closed the lab and left. Nobody has any clue till today. <laughs> so uh, that was one thing. We once blew up a, uh, so our campus was under, under construction. So there was a pillar being constructed. We did a static test on that. That pillar went off. Uh, we had a bench near our, uh, uh, basketball court, it had a one, each, uh, one feet thick concrete slab on which there was a tile. We mounted our rocket onto that, the concrete slab was gone. Uh, but we never hurt ourselves. Uh, so during this journey, uh, I realized that model rocketry in India is super unsafe. Uh, even someone like Rohan, who is 
so ingrained in space, he understands the problems of propellant and he understands the problems of propulsion and how difficult and how hard it can be and how dangerous it can be. Even he got hurt and I, I know hundreds of enthusiasts across the country who have at some point or the other destroyed something, hurt themselves, destroyed their property uh, in some way or the other. And that sort of triggered two things in me. Uh, one thing was that as a country, we were the, one of the top five spacefaring nations of the world. We had done all kinds of stuff. We had our own launch vehicles. We had our own satellite capability. We had this amazing research organization doing amazing stuff. And we did not have a rocketry ecosystem. Our children uh, could learn about astronomy, astrophysics. They could read star maps. They could uh, build water rockets. But they could not do model rocketry, which is such a core activity to space enthusiasm and space learning and uh, getting students interested in exploration and physics and math. Uh, and I, I, it just hit me and I felt so sad about it. Even being in IST, I could not build rockets easily. So uh, that was a major problem in my uh, mind. And then uh, the second part of it was that even the ones who did persevere and who pushed through that barrier and went on to do something, for them it was so unsafe because there was no infrastructure, there was no support, there were no parts available, there were no safety procedures, there were no regulations, there were no guidelines, uh, there was no safety gear available. So uh, that led to what is today called rocketeers. So I. Uh, quit ISRO and uh, started this company called uh, Rocketeers and we, our plan was to make rocketry for Indians accessible and safe. So uh, I don't build big rockets, I don't build rockets that go to space. Uh, these are small rockets, they fly maximum to 300 to 600 to 800 feet, uh, but they make it accessible for everyone to do it. I don't want to build big rockets, I don't want to build just 20, 50 rockets, I want to build 10 lakh rockets. So that was my technical challenge. We wanted to get to a position where we could sort of commercialize this activity, make it accessible to students and uh, get rockets and model rockets to everyone who knows about it and is interested and wants one. So sounds easy. It's been around for 40 years now. So uh, that's what we thought that model rocketry technology is around 40 years now. Uh, so it should not be much of a technical challenge, definitely not as much of a technical challenge as creating a reactor to form nanotubes or uh, ionizing water to give in space propulsion. It's definitely not as difficult. We definitely did not have to do Monte Carlo analysis on MATLAB for ions moving around an object. That was not needed. Uh, but we were wrong. It, when it comes down to the hands-on nitty-gritty of mastering propellant, it was a massive issue. So from, uh, for, from our fuel cartridge perspective, everything that is there in, so in a propulsion system at the end of the day, uh, if you want to imagine it, basically it's a large box with an explosion happening inside it and a hole at the end through which that explosion can go out. That's it. So you basically design three things. One, you design that large box. Second, you design that explosion. Uh, and third, you design that hole. Uh, so this large box tended to be a big problem for us when it comes to scale. So when I build one lakh rockets, there will be at least 10, 20, 30 of them which will blow up. Uh, I just cannot have that. My vision and my perspective and the idea with which we were doing it was that it should not blow up. Children should not get hurt. Uh, so it started and on the top of that we cannot, use, so as per Indian regulation, the propellant choice that we had, we cannot use metal, uh, we did not want to use high strength plastic, uh, it was just not sustainable, uh, anyway rockets are causing smoke, I didn't want to add plastic to the mix. Uh, so our only option left was natural fiber based uh, material solutions that we could use. So then we found out about this 300 metric fiber paper called Sackcraft. Uh, so if any one of you has seen cement bags around construction sites, uh, the cement bags are made out of Sackcraft paper. So this is the same type of paper that we found out about. And then there's something called uh, phenolic resin. Uh, it's, it's basically meth uh, methanol formaldehyde, I think. Yeah, uh, I don't remember exactly. So I don't remember names. So. Uh, 
the, we found out about these materials, we started building our own systems. Now, once we figured out on how to scale up, our scale up was manufacturing 1000 rockets or manufacturing 1500 or manufacturing 5000 was a major milestone. So, and when you look at the industry, the person who is manufacturing these tubes or these chemicals or the raw materials that I need for my nozzle, uh, there are two scenarios. One is a lab scenario where I can make five tubes, ten tubes. I definitely cannot make thousand. And then there is an industrial scenario where my industrial vendor says that, what are you talking about five thousand, ten thousand? My minimum order is one lakh. <laughs> like, an average order is 10 lakh tubes. So, we were not there, we were not here and we did not know what to do. So, what we ended up doing was we went into all of these manufacturing units which used to build the components that we sort of needed. We studied the manufacturing systems and then we built our own. So, we built our own paper tube manufacturing system, we built our own uh, uh, phenolic resin uh, mixing machine, uh, we built our own hydraulic press, uh, we built our own hydraulic chambers. I took a lot of help from Gadadhar to build our hydraulics actually. Um, and uh, that's how we sort of productionized rocketry in India. And today uh, I can say that we have flown more than 1 lakh rockets in our 4-5 year history. Uh, these rockets are, again I say, these are not big rockets, these are small, easy to use and super cheap. So how cheap you might ask. So if at the, if you wanted to build a model rocket in India when I was building one and Rohan was burning himself up in 2011, your cost would be approximately 9000 rupees for the rocket, the ignition system, the launch pad, no fuel cartridge because you cannot get fuel cartridge from uh, another country. Whereas you can get the rest of the things, it would cost you approximately 9000 rupees on Amazon. You could get, get all of those things and that would be one rocket, maximum like one and a half considering you could have really small, so chodu basic rocket. So that would be your 9000 9, to 10,000 would be your cost. Today uh, in India you can buy one of the same category of rockets from us directly from our website at 900 rupees. So uh, we've brought down a cost factor to, thank you. So, uh, we, we've brought down the cost factor by uh, like by a factor of 10. We plan to do this uh, by another factor of 4 in the next 5 years. So, we want to get to a point where a model rocket will at the end of the day be available for just 200 rupees in India. Uh, it will be safe, it will be international rocketry standard compliant, it will have class B, C, D, E and F motors available and it will enable model and amateur rocketry systems ecosystems, labs, teams, competitions, events, not only just in India, but all of these teams going to other countries and doing brilliantly. Uh, and that makes me really happy because uh, it still connects with space, which I feel so inspired about. And what I feel that this will do is that this will feed our space industry. This will feed the space industry with human resource that is needed. A model rocketry ecosystem in the US was approximately 40 years old and today all the leading space transportation companies in the world are